one of our members working in the public service, in the health service, in education, in local government, in civil service, in aviation. Uh, your work has been stellar and your commitment to community and society is, is a credit to yourselves and we're very proud of you and Forza. And my last bit of self-indulgence is just to say to thank each and every one of you and to thank each other. Just remind all your friends, your colleagues, stay safe and wear your masks. That's the best way we can uh, protect all those people working on the front line and working in the community. So, as I said, people are logging in. I'm going to introduce you through uh, the panelists that we have today. We're very lucky to be joined by experts in their field. And I'm going to take you to, through them in order. We have Dr. Sarah Burke, who's a research assistant professor in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, She's in the Centre for Health Policy and Management, School of Medicine at Trinity College. Her research interests are health policy, health systems, inequities in health and access to health care, as well as the politics of health reform. And she's currently the principal investigator on a HRB funded project, which is researching the potential of COVID-19 responses for the effective implementation of Solange Care. We also have Eamon Donnelly, who's the head of Forces Health Division, who has been a champion for every member of the Health Division for many years now. Most of you will know him from previous events, from conferences, from training, but mainly from his absolute commitment to making sure that every member in the Health Division, health and social care professionals, clerical admin staff, home health coordinators, people working in IT, everyone across the board gets represented to the best of Forces ability. We also have Dr. Mark Murphy, and when we were chatting before we came on air, I did make the, the lame joke about Dr. Doctor, and was it like a, a Mr. Mr. song? Dr. Mark Murphy is a PhD, a lecturer, a GP, and um, a strong advocate for Solange Care. So that's who we're going to have talking to us today. I mean, we all know that Solange Care has cross party support. It's meant to be about the right care at the right time, the right place. So we're very lucky to have these three um, distinguished panelists to talk to us today. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sarah Burke now, and this will be the first of our contributions. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine, and good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to Kevin for inviting me to participate in this for some. Uh, summer activist series uh, and I really welcome the event and I welcome the event because I think now more than ever we need universal health care and also now more than ever we need vocal activism to push for and deliver universal health care and a model of health care that's primarily community led. called Irish Apartheid with my sort of journalist hat on and more recently I've been working in academic health systems and health policy research and my two most recent projects, my previous project was around how to transform the unequal system we have into a universal system and I'm currently researching the implementation of Sloan Care. and originally that implementation research was around the design and implementation of the regions uh, but since COVID that's change to have a focus on if and how uh, the responses, the health system responses to COVID-19 can inhibit or accelerate our implementation of Sloan to Care. A uh, hundred years on from the foundation of the state, we don't have a universal health system and we are unusual or unique in a European health system context not to have that. And only in the last 10 years, have we had governments that have been committed to universal health care? Uh, initially in 2011, when the then Fine Gael Labour government promised to introduce universal health care through universal health insurance and universal primary care. Uh, and as you all know, neither of these were delivered. The, the main commitment around universalism in the 2016 programme for government 
you could argue was pretty much kicking to touch on universalism, but what it did do was it committed to the establishment of the Oireachtas Committee on the Future of Healthcare. And I give pretty much singular credit to Roshan Shortall for uh, drafting those terms of reference for that Oireachtas Committee, which included access to care based on need and universalism. Uh, at that time, I was researching, working on an academic research project around how to introduce universal health care in Ireland, and I was at, invited to present to the committee. And then the team I was coordinating won a tender to provide technical support to the committee. And we worked with that committee over a six month period, initially sort of workshopping health system, health policy matters, uh, and then assisted in drafting the report. And that report was published in 2017. And it provides a blueprint for the delivery of universal health care. It's, it's not a perfect report, uh, but it is a high level roadmap based on consensus of the direction that the Irish health system should go. In terms of um, I, what I'm doing right now is looking back with a view to looking where we are now and going forward. And if we're to assess where we are three years on from the publication of the report, I think it's fair to say that progress, there's been progress, but that progress has been slow. And the beginning of it was the slowest part. So it took 15 months to get anything out of the Department of Health in relation to Sloucher Care. Uh, and in, uh, I think it was August 2018, the Friday before a bank holiday weekend, the Sloucher Care Implementation Strategy was published. And shortly after that, Laura McGahey was hired as the executive director of the Sloucher Care Programme Implementation Office. And she's been leading a small office which is driving Sloucher Care Implementation. And that was a key recommendation of the original report. And they published uh, an action plan in 2019, which is closer to the original Sloucher Care document than the 2018 implementation strategy, but it's stronger on some elements than others. So for example, it's strong on how to deliver integrated care, and it's much weaker on an entitlement to care. We know pretty much what it takes to introduce major health system reform, and delivering universal health care or delivering smudger care is major health system reform. And we know it needs to be adequately resourced, often with the transition fund. It needs political leadership at the top. But crucially, it also needs that strong bottom-up support and implementation from frontline workers, from health professionals, but also from communities and citizens who are looking for access to care. And not all these components have been put in place. And I think crucially missing from Sloucher Care at its early stages uh, post publication has been uh, the political will to legislate for an entitlement to care and to adequately resort to the transition fund to put the system required in place to deliver timely access to high quality universal health care for everybody. Uh, I actually, I think Simon Harris got it and provided that political leadership, but I don't think it went beyond the Department of Health and the previous government and that caused problems for Sloucher Care. I've always said that the making or breaking of Sloucher Care would come after the second election after, would come after the election that's just happened. Well, it hasn't just happened, it's happened in February, but it's only two and a half weeks since we have a government, and um, particularly a program for government. And I think it's only now can we test does that political census, consensus that achieved the publication of the first Sloucher Care report, does that hold for delivering universal health care? And this might be something that comes up in our discussion later on. And obviously, pushing for that, there's a crucial role for unions and activists to play in that. When we went to vote in February, none of us knew we were about to experience a global pandemic uh, and that it would take five months to form a government. Looking at the programme for government and while preparing for this, I couldn't believe it's only two and a half weeks ago that the programme for government was published. But there's 14 pages dedicated to health policy and systems matters. And interestingly, there under the title Universal Healthcare. But actually, if you word check Universal Healthcare in the document, it only appears in the contents page and in the headline of the section. Uh, the, it, and it says that it has a mission of Universal Healthcare, and there's six subsections within that. And I won't go into too much detail on them, but 
I'm going to mention what I think are important ones. They talk about um, learning from the COVID healthcare responses, particularly in relation to e-health and e-prescribing. And I think there, there is lots we can learn and we should be learning from the COVID response. And then in that first paragraph, it also says, as we move forward, we will accelerate the implementation of Slauncher Care. Uh, and then in a section under implementing Slauncher Care, uh, it specifies, and I quote, Slauncher Care commits to ensuring people have access to affordable health services. And then it also, and I quote, states, we will maintain leadership at the highest level with the Cabinet Committee on Health, chaired by the Taoiseach, giving overall strategic direction and overseeing implementation of Slauncher Care. It then has a section around structural reform, which commits to delivering on the new regions. And it talks about finalising the consultants contract and legislating for public only work in public hospitals during uh, the second half of this year. Under fa fair and affordable care, it states that the government will seek to expand universal access to healthcare in a manner which is fair and affordable. And in this section, it also states it will retain access to private health services, ensuring choice for those accessing care. And then there's other specific sections I won't go into the details on. So universal health care and Sloncha care are in the programme for government. But as someone who was closely involved with drafting and working with the original report, the whole system reform as envisaged in the original report is not translated in the current programme for government. The original Snorch Care report had one of its principles as care provided free at the point of delivery based entirely on clinical need. And free and affordable are different concepts. Uh, the original report had that the implementation office would be in the Department of the Taoiseach, and it has always up to date been in the Department of Health. And the program for government interestingly talks about a cabinet committee chaired by the Taoiseach to um, drive the implementation of Sancho Care. So that's quite an interesting part of the programme for government. But crucially for me, there is no mention of an entitlement to care. Uh, and even though the, uh, the section on health is called universal health care, um, there are contradictions in it. And this is most evident in this complete contradiction to universal health care, which is retaining access to private health services ensuring choice for those accessing care. And that really reads more like, you know, a new labor or Thatcherite um, quote around choice and private health. A lot of my uh, academic research is around policy windows of opportunity. How does, when and how does change come about and how can that change be sustained? And in the policy windows, it's often the policy window of opportunity for big system reform is often driven by a major shock in the, the system. And I strongly believe that the pandemic more than ever has demonstrated the need for universal health care. The public health and the health system response to COVID-19 has been largely, nearly entirely driven by the public health system. And I think makes the case for everyone for universal access to care, which is provided largely through a strong public health system. That said, we know that delivering universal access to quality, timely, integrated health care requires political leadership, it requires funding, it requires long-term investment and an empowerment of workers, of communities and public support. Uh, 17, 18 days uh, into our programme for government, uh, I think that window of opportunity for Slauncher Care and Universal Health Care is, is still open, uh, but I think it's too soon to tell whether that will shut or that can be used to continue a path towards delivering universalism. And I'll leave it there, Catherine. Thanks, Sarah. That's very insightful. And I, I think the, the terms apartheid kind of struck a chord probably with a, with a lot of people. Just before we move on to Dr. Mark Murphy, Sarah, if, if I was to ask you just a quick question, um, would, what would you see as the biggest barrier, considering it has par cross party support, what would you see as the biggest barrier? Is it that trying to keep that parallel uh, piece of protecting uh, private health care while maintaining this universal access or would it be the structural change or would you see them as intertwined? Oh, there's about five questions there. Um, time to get ready. 
or three. Uh, well, first of all, there was political consensus, and I very much witnessed it amongst the committee. Uh, but I would question how broad across the Oireachtas that, that political consensus was in the last government. Uh, and I think it's too soon to tell how strong that political consensus is uh, in the current government. Uh, some of my previous research, and in fact, my PhD research was around uh, the early 2000s and the increased privatization of hospital care. And that very clearly showed how a powerful minister can uh, dominate, even if there is some level of political consensus. So I think it remains to be seen in this new government how that cons political consensus holds. But ultimately, you need not just the health minister, but the finance minister and the Taoiseach driving it. And I think if they're driving it, then any of those sums of the whole part of social care be can be delivered. But if they're not behind it, then it's really hard to do it. And you just end up doing piecemeal bits, which means you don't really give the system reform that's needed. It's great. Thanks for that, Sarah. And just before I, I move on to Dr. Mark Murphy, just two bits of housekeeping that I should have said beforehand is that um, for everyone who's logging on, you can ask questions through the question and answer facility on WebEx, and we'll be putting them to our three panellists at the end of the three uh, presentations. Um, and also, if you want to tweet um, to join the conversation, I'm going to actually have to make sure I read this out properly, or Joe O'Connor will kill me if I get it wrong. I make don't want to tweet him the wrong thing. So it is. Bear with me now. That's it. This isn't an IT problem. This is a me having to read problem. So it's the hashtag is force the summer series. So just if anyone wants to use that. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mark Murphy now. As I said, he's a double doctor, he's a GP and a PhD and a lecturer. So we're very interested in, in what he has to say to us today. Uh, thanks to Forza for inviting me to speak today, and it's um, it's wonderful to speak after Sarah. I think she's been, you know, um, not only a, a leading kind of academic um, in in describing the deficiencies in the Irish healthcare system, but she's also, you know, been a, a leading light in terms of advocacy as well. So um, a, a lot of what I say is probably informed by by the content and uh, articles she she's written. So just to start, um, I have no conflicts of interest, I think. I'm a GP and I also do some teaching in the Royal College of Surgeons. I'm a member of my union, uh, the GP committee of the IMO. I'm on a committee in the Medical Council, but I have no other funding sources per se. I have two sources of income. Um, so just in keeping with uh, with with Sarah's uh, kind of comment there, if you were Michal Ma, would you put your money uh, and give it to Stephen Donnelly in the Department of Health, or would you scatter it amongst uh, this assorted new cabinet? And I think, as Sarah alluded to uh, with Charlie McCreevy in the past as a Minister for Finance, it's unusual how um, health decisions happen outside of the Department of Health. And obviously, you're talking about uh, our children and our future, and about sexual education for children, and about looking after children with disabilities. Obviously, uh, progressive taxation structures, you're talking about housing, what an important portfolio that is, and of course, social protection and buttressing against poverty. So what I'm getting at before I talk about universal health care is really a, an important concept that I suppose that's why many people end up being socialists or social democrats, because they understand the role of the state in protecting against and determining and and, and um, those the social determinants of health that provide um, the resources that all of us live to uh, have the economic and social means to live our, our fullest lives. So, you know, the state is giving over 18 billion to the Department of Health specifically this year, but it's also as important of contact, context to realize that that public expenditure is only a portion of the overall healthcare expenditure, which is also made up of private healthcare expenditure. And how does the government regulate and get involved with that private uh, expenditure? And as you can see, we're spending more and more. We're not the highest uh, uh, payer in the OECD, or like many commentators say. We've had historical underfunding. We need a massive structural reform with Slaunch Care, and that needs massive funding. We're, we're a little bit higher than average, understandably. 
Um, but what's driven a lot of our escalation is private expenditure over the past seven years, which is very interesting. What exactly is universal health care? I think it's always important just to kind of go over that. There's lots of definitions. One definition, and I just lay stark where we are uh, by the World Health Organization, is the goal of universalism is to ensure that all people obtain the health services they need without suffering financial hardship when they pay for them. So for our community or country to achieve this, we need a well-run health system that meets priority healthcare needs. So that touches upon healthcare inequalities. It's going to be affordable. And that's a key part about the financial structures of our healthcare system. And there's a variety of ways to, to do that. Uh, we need access to medicines and technologies, and we need capacity and staff, and obviously built capacity and IT capacity as well. So how's Ireland doing here? Well, I think we really fail at universal healthcare, as Sarah has alluded to. We have poor access in terms of primary care and in terms of secondary care. There are massive out-of-pocket costs, so it's not affordable. And the market um, is a large proportion of the healthcare uh, activity, and that is obviously a very poor way in social democracies to provide for important uh, services such as healthcare and education. Uh, there's obviously poor capacity, and I do think it's important to say, uh, you know, the governance structures within the public system are are not are not appropriate, um, and I think that needs to be revisited so that the public sector in health can can really thrive. So I think aspects here there's the primary care and general practice end of things and over half the population access the free market for their primary care it's unheard of it doesn't happen anywhere else patients have to pay large out-of-pocket expenses so that they can receive care and it's also a very poor business model for gps you might not want to hear that we don't have enough gps either and i think in the primary care sphere there's just a lot of uncertainty um, around how services are planned, and there is poor governance. And then in secondary care, well, it's quite inefficient, and there's this very unfair, unfair intertwining of public and private systems, and uh, obviously manifest with their trolleys. So there's like there's funding deficits. We need a massive in, in, influx of funding. We need capacity uh, to be improved. We need better governance, and this complex interplay between public and private has to be addressed. And we have to think about these failures of regulation um, of the market forces. So I might just touch upon the two sides to it then. So from my perspective, predominantly working as a GP, um, universal primary care, we can increase eligibility, what Sarah was saying about access, absolutely. Uh, more people should not have to, you know, should be able to see their GP without incurring this uh, large out-of-pocket cost. And it's kind of academic, whether or not it's through age bands or through means testing, people can, um, and and some colleagues can say that it's unfair, it's not economically progressive to use age bands. If we're going to get to the same point, whatever way we get there, I think is good enough. Um, I think there there is possibly a reasonable argument or debate or discussion to be had about whether or not there should be a small fee at the point of contact. But I think the research shows that, that probably does not deter usage. And I think that... Um, if everyone gets free GP care, we will need more GPs and practice nurses. And we already need new GPs and practice nurses. And I think that can be planned and organized, but it needs to be structured and needs political leadership. And I do think the program for government didn't really go strong enough in terms of a five-year program for government about really opening up universalism in primary care. I think the market and general practice, and I'm working in it at the moment, has very perverse incentives. I've just set up a new practice with colleagues. Um, it's absolutely hugely risky. There are massive risks. It's very difficult and very challenging. And really, there's no one listening to GPs. There's no one encouraging young practices to set up, and we're really floundering, and it's troubling. I think in primary care, we also need to be care careful that if we increase more, if we provide more doctor visit cards to patients, well, th there's a lot more to primary care than GPs. There are the wonderful psychologists, there's the physiotherapists, there are all the allied healthcare professionals, the public health nurses. Doc cards do not provide eligibility for the rest of primary care. And this is a very, we have to be careful about the increased provision of doctor visit cards without wider entitlements to primary care. And of course we need capacity, but we also predominantly need much better governance and mapping. 
I really have no input at all in how services are mapped or planned. Uh, no one really feels I have any way to feed into a governance structure. And I think with Solange Care, with how the community health networks will be organized, I think this is a massive, massive win for how uh, universal primary healthcare could happen. In terms of universal secondary, so I think with primary healthcare, it is entirely achievable for us to have universal primary healthcare. Uh, although we have to be aware that the current inequality is at least progressive in that it's a means tested medical cards. But, so we have to be aware that we can get to a universal healthcare system. Um, and I think, I, I don't think that the current program for government has really been strong enough on this issue. In terms of universal secondary healthcare, if I have time just to touch upon that, I'm just going to say a couple of things. We have a public system and a private system. We have a payer and a provider, the state and the hospitals. We have insurance companies and private providers. My issue is that there's a very complex interplay between these two entities. So if you look at where they overlap, the public system definitely benefits from the private system because it gets money from private insurers. And the De Butler report mentioned this. There's also some, um, there's also, I think I'm just gonna turn my AirPods off. Uh, can you hear me, Catherine? Yeah, not if you can't hear me anymore. So I'll just go back. The public system also, um, pr public consultants get a benefit because they can get a top up in salary because of they do procedures in the public hospital on patients who are private. And there's also this argument about uh, the private system keeps the pressure off. I just don't buy any of this. The private system massively benefits entirely from the public system and leverages off it and benefits from it and makes them an awful lot of money from it because it's not open 24 seven. They don't look after the patients with the most severe illnesses. It doesn't look after the social care needs and non-lucrative, non-procedure based care. It's closed at weekends and over holidays. There are the tax breaks that Sarah alluded to before in their development when, when uh, private hospitals were built and in terms of health insurance. And really the entire state and taxpayer base are subsidizing the system. And increasingly now, I would worry about the National Treatment Purchase Fund as a vehicle to pay for activity. And that isn't in Slauncher Care, and that is definitely an ideology that is part of the program for government, not implicitly there. It's like one of those unsaid policies, but it's there and that's very troubling. So I think that the public system loses, loses, loses in this system. And the nice thing about Slauncher Care is that it uncouples that and it will expose the private system to the market that it actually likes, uh, but to its detriment. And I think we need, I, 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 think, I think one of the things that's interesting about Solange Care is that it says we are actually going to keep a private system though, but less people will choose to have health insurance. I don't have health and healthcare insurance um, and patients are absolutely terrified uh, to get it out. We do need to address consultant contracts, and I would absolutely support the reversal of, it, of all cuts for new entrants across the public sector, including high earners such as consultants. It's absolutely impacting um, recruitment, and that needs to be addressed. And we do have to think about capacity, which is partly related to the consultant contract and governance. So slauncher care can happen, but there are a lot of other options thrown around. This National Treatment Purchase Fund is going to bleed the public sector capacity and resources. It's just not the right way. And we have lots of other people now, we've John Crown and lots of wonderfully articulate consultants, particularly talking about forget Slauncher Care. We need single payer insurance models, money follows the patient, multi-annual, but and all these words that are put out there and they're not without risks. And I think we have to be very careful of commodifying healthcare, paying for procedures and really have a private provision of healthcare. It's not an all and evil, but I think the publicly funded, so the payer and provided care is cheaper for the Irish healthcare system. I'm just gonna say a couple, we have to be very careful about conflicts of interest and vested interests. I am a vested interest. There are wonderful leftist doctors who try this word vested interest. We are vested interests, just like we taxpayer. And I'm afraid if a consultant does earn half a million a year in the current system, and in the future would earn 220,000 in the future system, and they are talking against the future system, I think that has to be called out. It's, it's not a problem. I'm not, call, I'm not saying it's, it's an issue, 
But that is by definition a conflict of interest. And we have to be able to call that out because those conflicts of interest are everywhere. Over medicalization is probably the biggest issue in our healthcare system. And this is a model of by which I look at healthcare. We need more effective care, the right care, as Catherine was saying, at the right time, at the right place. We need salon care to do that. But on the other end of the pendulum, we have too much ineffective care happening, over testing, over treatment, commodification, risk, worry, marketing on our airwaves, come, seek, consume, and risks and labels. So on one side, we have unmet need and we need, we need to address that and we need more effective care. On the other hand, we need to really reduce this over medicalization. And the way to do that is through Solange Care. It's not through privatization which will supercharge the right side of this balance. And we do also have to be aware of prudent economic costs. As a, as a social economy in the EU, EU, healthcare is not a normal market. And the more healthcare we provide, the more it will be consumed. And we just have to be mindful of that. So this is the programme for government. It's my last slide. And these are the domains which Sarah has touched upon. And Slauncher Care and Universal Healthcare are written large right there. However, I do that universal primary care and general practice. It has not gone far enough on entitlements. And I do worry as well about the concept that private care will be kept. I mean, it's so complex healthcare. What exactly do they mean by that? Are they actually decoupling private and public care and public hospitals or not? I mean, it's very confusing. And I do think that there's an awful, there are an awful lot of words in the, these pages on healthcare, and it's left me a little bit puzzled about the original cross-party consensus and where that is. So I hope uh, I didn't speak too long, Catherine. Thanks very much. Thanks for that, Mark. That was extremely interesting and thought-provoking. Um, I'm going to do to you what I did to Sarah. I'm just going to ask one question while Amy's getting himself ready. Um, just one thing you touched upon there, and it'll be of particular interest to any of our health and social care professionals that have tuned in today. FORSA, um, it is the only union who've agreed to participate in the trial of the nine learning sites, and I'm sure Eamon might mention this later on. But just from your GP perspective, how would you, um, if you had a magic wand, I suppose, how would you marry the, the, the piece between the GPs and the, the networks with the health and social care professionals? Because as you rightly said, you know, a, a GP visit card isn't going to get you access to physio. It's not going to get you access mm. to a dietitian that might be able to keep you at home for longer. And there's all sorts of layers to it. But from just from a solely selfish perspective, as a GP, you'd imagine what? How would you like to link in with the networks? Uh, two things. I think that incrementally, if 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 increasing, like in NHS, GPs are sole independent practitioners. They're private businesses, but everyone is covered. The premises are paid for by the state. There are pensions. So the risks are mitigated against and GPs do well and they have rewards and they can retire early. GPs in Ireland, we are at the market forces and we're, have, we're struggling. And I think that increasingly as the state provides eligibility to more people, there will be a greater buy-in by GPs and also of the HSE department about the role of GPs. We will be subsumed into management structures part of the state provision of care. So that I think that can happen over 10 years. And concurrent to that, as GPs enter governance structures within community health networks, there are obvious overlaps and allegiances. So it's almost, wow, 20 years since the primary care strategy, primary care teams, primary care networks about how governance will work. That is an absolute fallacy. I've ne I never meet anyone in my job any, any, not in the first two years of setting up as a general practice, haven't met anyone else working in primary care. I give them a phone call and if I can get through, I talk to them, I talk to pharmacists, but there's no governance, there's no structure. So I think it can happen, but it needs to be defined and that has to come through community health networks. And I really believe that that will happen if those governance structures are there and if more eligibility happens. Thanks for that. Um, so that was Dr. Mark Murphy. We're now moving on to Eamon Donnelly, who I mentioned is the head of our health division, but he was also previously the head of our civil service division. So he ha Eamon has a particular insight into how uh, the manoeuvrings happen in government buildings. Um, Eamon, I'll hand over to you now for your presentation. Well, uh, thanks, Catherine. I uh, hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, 
I could just say, well, I agree totally with Sarah and Mark, and thank you very much. Um, but um, I'd like for the audience just to say that um, unions take positions on work, uh, workplace issues based on the reaction to something an employer does. And in this session, I'm here panelists. So let's set aside positions for the moment. Of, uh, of the subject. And anybody who has been brought to tears by me in previous uh, sessions will know that I've been saying for three to four years now that for Snodgy Care to happen, uh, a number of seismic cultural shifts need to happen in this country. Um, and some of it's been touched on. A move away from a hospital centric health system uh, where we don't of the health system by how many trolleys uh, are appear on the news as um, being uh, in corridors uh, or what the size of waiting list is. And because that simply results in crisis reaction, political pressure, and subsequent crisis reaction. So that's the first shift that needs to take place. The second shift, that Mark has, uh, has covered this in very, very uh, informative um, uh, way, is a different relationship between general practitioner and state. Um, and the next piece, uh, and something you just touched on there, Catherine, yourself, uh, is cross referrals from profession to profession. Um, not two or three different gateways that make the, um, the patient queue up uh, in, in an uncoordinated manner. And of course, what we've been speaking about, the removing of private practice from the public health system and the model of how hospitals attract funding. Um, it seems uh, bizarre. Well, the, the, the health system that we have belongs clearly in the past, but it seems bizarre that the taxpayer would uh, fund uh, voluntary private health insurers who then provide a reward for a public hospital for a private uh, procedure to take place. That seems absolutely bizarre. Uh, it's, it absolutely needs to change. Um, we know uh, from listening to the previous speakers, and uh, it's something that FORSA is, has majored on in recent years, is there needs to be not only an emphasis on community interventions, but also pre-intervention. For example, health promotion cannot, can no longer be seen as a luxury item. If health promotion is to be considered a luxury item, well, then we may not have advertisement campaigns for any. It, it, it would just seem to be, well, just a waste of resource. But I'll give you an example. In recent times, and the portfolios that are um, in uh, the community health networks, uh, that is primary care, social care, uh, mental health and health and well-being, we saw a saturation of the social care model because social care is the biggest growing industry we have in health. So when there was pressure on social care, it was decided that the best thing to do would be to transfer some of the work over to health and well-being. And what that would simply do is take health promotion out in one fell swoop. So you're already in negative equity about planning for the future if you're going to see the likes of health promotion as a luxury item. Um, the other thing I say is um, an oft vilified group that FORSA represents that seem to be just in a side to the health services is our health managers. We have a health uh, management system that's been vilified as superfluous and unaccountable. Uh, and I simply don't accept that. I simply uh, do not accept that. And what I will say about that is if our health managers were allowed to manage without being held up uh, and vilified, for example, I'll give you the, the, a great example of a hospital manager in, 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 in um, hospitals around the country, like such as Port Leash and all, the, all these places. Every time there's a trolley watch announcement, the hospital manager gets held up as unaccountable. And that's simply not, that's simply not true. The reason why there's, a, why there's um, an overload of trolleys is because we haven't gone near implementing the type of community-led interventions that we need to in the first place. Um, I also um, need to talk about our health and social care professionals because they are key to community interventions. And we've been uh, championing this idea in the political system for some time now. And not only um, in terms of the interventions that health and social care professionals make in their profession as life-changing interventions in terms of the quality of life of a patient, but also how we tap into their expertise in becoming occupants of service planning and delivery posts where their expertise is drawn upon within the community to plan 
services and deliver them. Um, strategic uh, action number four in the implementation strategy referenced uh, by Sarah earlier is expand the workforce. So we already know that we need to expand the workforce, but there's a number of things about that. In the health and social care professional field, um, we are already uh, wildly uh, deficient in numbers, and yet Solange Care envisages an extra 1,400. So, and what I would say about that is, um, there needs to be some long thought out process where the, to become a health and social care professional is made a more attractive option for somebody going to college. So what needs to happen is there needs to be a clear career pathway and um, that shows students that they can aspire to something uh, that are at the center of service planning and delivery ultimately, and in a community led uh, health service that they would be, um, that there is a, a career there for them. Because the only way we're going to deliver universal healthcare is in a multidisciplinary model of excellence. There's no other way. And what I'll say about that is, um, this is, this is myself as a union official uh, speaking union here, and um, unions have a part to play in that too. Because for too long now, uh, various unions have uh, clamored on behalf of their own turf, not seeing the bigger picture, and it increases uh, political pressure on the system. And it seems to me that it creates a rivalry from uh, across the, uh, the health globe, if you like. Uh, whereby um, those who make the most noise uh, create the most pressure and it generates, uh, it, I would say, a fractured industrial relations system. And while uh, the previous speakers are not involved in industrial relations, uh, we are. And a fractious industrial relations system makes it very difficult to get people to buy in to the multidisciplinary model of excellence that is going to be required to deliver soldier care. And just on that, and that's where I would say, I think we got it right. We've had our critics, but I think FORSA in participating in the trial of the community health networks has been a really good move because I think we will get to see how it can work and how it doesn't work and what we need to do to make the things that don't work begin to work. And I think we should uh, proceed on that basis towards a model of excellence. Of course, if you pursue a model of excellence, well then life is going to have to change. Uh, is a model of excellence um, between uh, Monday and Friday, nine to five, going to be really a, an attraction in terms of uh, increased investment? Okay, so we know we need an additional resources. We know we need a whole pile of funding, but I think it's no longer sustainable that the, uh, the, the delivery of health services would be as restricted as, as they have traditionally been. Uh, we also spoke about the lessons uh, that we can take from the COVID response and I kind of break this into two uh, different aspects. One is the things we can learn, uh, e-health, the things we can learn in remote working, but not losing the patient focus. Uh, and how best we can capture this that attracts a buy-in from the workforce. But one thing I will say about the COVID response is there is a danger, and we are aware of it, that because the COVID response uh, which, as Mark rightly said, uh, uh, was completely um, uh, provided by the public health system, because the COVID response uh, was, was seen to be uh, pliant, flexible, and quick, uh, the trade union movement, uh, and in particular FORSA, stood aside from its usual position and allowed a command and control model uh, because there was a national health emergency. And that was that sustainable in the short term, it's not sustainable in the long term. The balance is learning what we can learn from uh, how, uh, how collaborative, collaboratively we were able to do things and getting the buy-in from the workforce to be able to do that rather than a command and control system. Um, just from the implementation strategy, and in case anybody thinks I'm uh, against hospitals, I am not. I think hospitals uh, should not be overcrowded drop-in centers. I think they should be centers of excellence to provide acute and related care um, to, to, to the best uh, model possible. But the uh, implementation strategy, and I'll read a quote from it, it says, hospitals continue to be the default option for a lot of care needs due to perverse incentives, lack of capacity, and underdevelopment and poor communication of alternative care options. 
So when we go to integrate our hospital groups with our community networks, as envisaged in the six new uh, geographical areas, here's something just to think about from an industrial relations perspective. The chief officer of the community, and it, it's only a pay issue, but it, it's very instructive, is paid significantly less than the chief officer of a hospital group. That's very instructive to me because it still tells me that the people who are planning the services think that in some way, shape or form, that the hospital carries more weight than the community-led intervention. And really, you were talking about integration. It's got to be integration in its truest sense. I can't go on without mentioning the role of another often vilified cohort um, among uh, health force uh, health workers, and that is um, our administrators. Who, and Catherine, you yourself have been on the radio uh, defending the fact that we don't have enough of them. And it's quite simple. They have been unsung heroes of the health service for a long time. The first person you meet when you go into a hospital is, a, is an administrator. And very often, um, administrators could be doing work that doesn't prevent clinicians from being clinicians and allows a focus on the clinician to be a clinician supported by people with a generic, uh, highly agile skill set that's tra transferable across the, the health system. And before I do a little wrap up um, of the things that I felt I must say, um, I can't uh, help but mention one uh, big issue that hasn't come up yet, and that's the model of Section 39 Agency Healthcare. It is no longer sustainable to have voluntary organisations with cap and hand funding providing direct service to the like of disability and people with mental health needs. That funding is no longer sustainable. And it isn't at high time that the government wrote into its policy that the state is going to provide the services in a proper funded model. So, in relation to the delivery of uh, Sanja Care, I know that there is scepticism about the report. Uh, in terms of the political will to deliver it, uh, even though the authors of the report are 100% uh, committed to what was a fantastic job. And I learned this when I was at an Oireachtas committee meeting, and one of the uh, members of the Oireachtas committee on healthcare actually said, maybe we should rename it a vision for change. So if I had one message for the new minister, I would say, please minister, do not give us another vision for change. We have had visions for change for the last 20 years, what we need is implemented change. I wonder how many people as citizens made it their business in the run-up to the election campaign to say, do you, know what, do you know what's really important to me as you look for my vote is the delivery of access universities. And I just think that as a, as a society, um, we are very, very passive. And I'm not, uh, I'm not urging insurrection by any manner or means. What I am saying, there's a difference between passive and compliant. I think we'll all see that people's cooperation with the uh, restrictions in recent times shows that we are compliant. But I think we are passive to decisions taken about healthcare um, that will never make it better. And I think it's time that citizens um, took it upon themselves to place pressure on the political system to give us the healthcare system that we need for the future. That, of course, begs the question before I finish. Um, taxation, do we pay enough of it? Maybe, maybe not. We probably don't pay enough of it to fund the type of model that we've been proffering. But hey, how many people on middle incomes are paying X amount of thousand euro per year to a voluntary health insurer? And I think that's where the area of taxation and um, needs to be examined. So the last thing I'm going to uh, finish with is one thing that I am aware of, and it's not true, uh, just some glib opinion. It's because I've been in the room when I've seen the dynamic at play. Our policymakers in the Department of Health do not trust our executors, i.e. the HSE, to spend money wisely. So it's very, very difficult for the HSE, which is often vilified, and I'm glad that um, people, are, uh, people are actually standing back during, uh, following the pandemic and saying, you know what, didn't the HSE do a good job on behalf of us all and aren't they capable of it when, 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 the, when the climate presents itself? But you can't progress through 
uh, a, a planned health service if the policymakers then don't trust the executors to go and do the job. So um, we need to change it, as we know. Um, we can't just sit there um, and say, well, uh, and I think this is one of the problems with the political system. Well, look, we won't change it, and specifically the stuff that Mark mentioned about consultant, because it's always been that way. Well, if things were left alone because they've always been that way, we would be still locking people up with mental health issues in secure units. And we all know that that is not a good outcome. So there are just some thoughts from previous contributors and um, uh, some of the views I have uh, as I've been involved in uh, community-led uh, health negotiations uh, over the last couple of years. So thank you. Thanks, Eamon, for that. Um, I have one question for you as well, because I did it to everybody else. But as somebody who, along with our members and our activists, was at the, the, the cold face of the uh, the reaction, the, the, the workforce reaction during the pandemic, what one positive, or not, maybe not one, but what would you see as something positive we could take from how we dealt with the pandemic and that we could uh, transfer into how we work towards bringing Sancho Care into, a, into a, a real meaningful operation. This is a kind of a, a theoretical uh, or an ideological answer to a specific question. I actually think that what the national health emergency did was it gave everybody the same target capture. And very often uh, in the delivery of healthcare, people go into jobs and they don't have the same target because they're not prescribed the same target. And I think this, this time around, everybody was working towards the same ambition. And the number of um, uh, the, the number of measures that were able to arise uh, out of that, I think, is something that we should really. Thanks, Simon. So, look, I know everyone's um, logged in, and possibly a lot of our members are on their lunch break. We're going to move to the questions and answers. Um, what I'm going to do is put three questions. It, as one to to our group of panelists, and then take them in the order of Mark, then Sarah, then Eamon. So, and we've had some great uh, participation from from the people logging in. But the, the combined questions are, I, I, I'll read them as are. So, there's a political census around salon care. But is there anything you would like to change about the salon care plan? How confident are you that this government will provide the necessary funding and political will to fully implement salon care? And then my favourite of the day, what is the first thing you would do as Minister for Health to accelerate the delivery of universal health care in Ireland? So I'll ask uh, uh, Mark if you'd take those questions first. Thanks. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, Mark. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. okay. I totally agree with the values of Slauncher Care. I think uh, I agree with the plan. I think there's two issues really regarding the communication piece. So um, I think that's about there's almost an idea that most doctors are against Slauncher Care, the unions, the consultants. That's a fallacy. I think there are many young doctors uh, who are the future of the profession who want a fairer, better healthcare system that's community orientated, that is better integrated care. And I think we're missing that communication piece and Slauncher Care needs to get into the town halls, gets into the local communities. Uh, and I mean, these 96 uh, community health networks, I think we need those to be singing the what can what they can do for uh, communities health. So there's a kind of a communication piece and obviously the implementation and funding, it hasn't been there, I think. The funding just hasn't been there quite yet. Regarding um, Minister for Health wise, what I'd do, I like it's a very challenging issue, but it's not on one person. And I think it's actually the Minister for Finance and the Cabinet that will agree the delivery of funds that can allow the Minister for Health as one agent of the Cabinet and their other you know, ministers for state there too, to enact those policies with the cross, it's a cross party plan. So I really think. I don't want Stephen Donnelly to, ha to have bravado and to swagger. It's not his. It's a cross-party plan. And I think that universal primary care can happen. 
And regarding the hospitals, let's decouple public private care. It's inefficient. It's not right. And you just have to make that work and we need funding. And I think that's it. The second question was about a confidence. Was it about how confident I am that it will work? Um, yeah, like I, 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 I think that unfortunately that is all about funding and it's not, it's that that's about, um, you know, really Pascal O'Donoghue uh, and the broader cabinet. And there's a, you know, a subcommittee in health in the cabinet and we need actually leadership there. So we need people power and we need the Slauncha Care Office and a communication piece to really kick in now. COVID, Sarah's right, COVID has shown the values of solidarity and Eamon touched upon this too, about a common objective. And we need to capitalize on that, have a communication piece about what is possible. And I do think it can happen, but I don't think it'll happen without a bit of a push. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Eamon, I'll ask you the same questions and put those questions to you now. Uh, the answer to that is uh, no, because uh, I think um, uh, people are suffering from restructuring fatigue. We have a plan that was created in good faith by people who worked really hard to get that plan. And even though um, there might be things in it that some, none or all of us like or dislike, it's a plan that was created to give us a quality healthcare system. And I think rather than tailor around with it, we should just try and get on with it. That's the answer to question one. How confident I am, I'm not sure. Um, because uh, I think um, uh, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating when it comes to legislating for the removal of uh, private practice in the public health system. Um, and as Mark has already said, uh, the provision of resources and tackling the um, behemoth is the uh, industry and how uh, it, it attracts funding and then provides funding back to public hospitals for doing uh, private uh, procedures. Um, the first thing I do as Minister for Health, I agree entirely with Mark, this is not the Minister for Health's uh, um, product. This is cross-party product on behalf of us all. Um, and quite frankly, um, the implementation strategy is there. What's wrong with it? Uh, go, and, uh, go and implement it as well. It's Sarah, I know you're you're tied up, and you might have to get to a meeting. But if, if you are, and, and we we we've held you on to very long. But if you did have a, a minute, the last question really is: um, What would you, if you were Minister for Health, what's the first thing you would do to accelerate Slauncha Care, and how confident would you be that the government will provide funding? Uh, okay, I can't really hear your question, Catherine. So I, um, I might guess it, which is, um, if I was the Minister for Health, what would I want to do to implement that's social it. care? Um, and maybe you can wave at me or tell me if that's the right question or something. Uh, for me, what is most critical is that two things need to happen. Uh, we need to legislate for an entitlement to care. So to say by the 1st of January 2024 or 2025, it will take time to do, but that there will be a universal in entitlement to care. And two, to get cross-party political consensus uh, to fund that, to fund the transmission fund, to fund the money that's needed to resource so our system can deal with universal access. And I think if you have that legislation for an entitlement and the highest level political support for resourcing it, you, it's, as, it, it's as good a chance as any of delivering it. Okay, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, I think we've run over time, which is always a sign of, of a good conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists, Dr. Sarah Burke, Dr. Mark Murphy, and Force's own um, Eamon Donnelly. In particular, I'd like to take, thank all the participants who took time out of their day to log on and, and listen to what I feel was a really interesting and insightful 
conversation. Um, and thanks to everyone who put forward questions. And just one last message, stay safe and wear your masks. Thanks everybody. Thanks.